Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our participants and speakers, and a warm welcome to the fifth of the webinar series, Spring Back. This webinar series is utmost important to all of us and the industry members put together because of the current situation in the diamond sector and the heavy and acute volatility that we are facing, and the diamond industry members are really staring at a very, very volatile future. Uh, today we have experts from the industry, from the, re, uh, the council, the certification and grading, producers, manufacturers, and of course, Ms. Nirupa Bhatt will be moderating the session. The webinar series is uh, important for another reason. We will also dwell on the topic of finance and inventory. These are the two topics which are really important for the industry today. I thank the presenters and the support partners for this webinar and uh, would request Anand to run a small video. Today, it is not the strongest that survives, but the most adaptable. The World Federation of Diamond Bourses is constantly adapting itself to an ever-changing reality. That's why we are proud to present Get Diamonds, our new state-of-the-art online diamond center for the industry, by the industry. With Get Diamonds, you get transparency, you get a competitive free market that gets you more business. That's how in five weeks, you get a platform with $5 billion in total value. So don't get left behind. Get Diamonds, the biggest diamond search platform in the world. This is a diamond created completely by nature. A precious mineral older than life on Earth. We can quantify its value using the four C's. Color, cut, clarity, and carat weight. But to know what makes it truly special, we must go beyond. At the De Beers Group, we want to share our expertise with those who value these exquisite gems as much as we do. Let us take you on a journey three billion years into the past and hundreds of kilometers below the surface of the Earth. This diamond was born from naturally occurring extreme temperatures and crushing pressures. Carried to the surface by deep source volcanic eruptions, it has lain undiscovered for geological ages. Until now. With pioneering exploration and mining technologies, we can find and extract it. With expert cutting and polishing, we can bring out its inner light. And with extraordinary knowledgeable people, we can share our passion with the world. From mining to grading, we at the De Beers Group have expertise in every stage of the diamond pipeline. This has given us the tools to build innovative, flexible and enriching courses, both online and laboratory based, to help you better understand how these stunning gifts of nature came to be. Because if you love diamonds, your customers will too. Go beyond the four seas. Discover a story billions of years in the making. Well, thank you, Anand. A huge thanks to Ms. Rashish Garg, head of uh, KGK Middle East, and Ms. Nirupa Bhatt, who have been supporting our webinar series and taking the trade to a logical conclusion. Can I request Mr. Ashish Garg to say a few words and open the webinar? Thank you, Sadhu. Uh, good afternoon. I welcome all the speakers and participants from the diamond industry to this very important webinar that will dwell upon the topic of preparedness in new era. Our industry has seen challenging times currently and is staring at a volatile tomorrow. So today's topic is specifically catering to diamond trade, which is an important topic for me personally as well as we at KGK are deeply involved in diamond business from mines to market. We are hoping for a quick recovery and a healthy business environment in the future. In the webinar today, eminent speaker has been invited to address the members on the current situation of the industry and a new tomorrow. I'm sure this session will give us international perspective and dwell upon the local challenges and will help us prepare our business for the future. Today, we have Ms. Nirupamaji back with us as a moderator for this important topic. Uh, welcome back, ma'am. And thank you once again, all. And over to you, Sibu, to introduce all the speakers. Thank you so much, Mr. Garg. And it's a 
pleasure and a privilege to state that we have amongst our participants delegates from State Diamond Trader South Africa, Antwerp World Diamond Center Belgium, Dubai Multi Commodity Center Dubai UAE, Ministry of Mines Zimbabwe, and Ministry of Mineral Resources Republic of Angola. Warm welcome to all the delegates for this webinar. It also gives me immense pleasure to introduce our panelists for today who would be taking us through their experiences and expertise. I start with Dr. Martin Lake, who's a special advisor for Precious Stones at DMCC, appointed to the position in June 2018. Martin is responsible for expanding and diversifying DMCC's Precious Stone portfolio and helping to grow Dubai into the number one diamond trading hub in the world. As company secretary of the Dubai Diamond Exchange, Martin focuses on driving trade through the exchange by forging and strengthening commercial partnerships with stakeholders across the diamond industry. To improve governance, compliance, and responsible sourcing, he also chairs the organizing committee for DMCC's flagship diamond event, the Dubai Diamond Conference. With over 15 years of experience in marketing, both rough and polished diamonds, Martin is an expert on the economics of diamond mining and an internationally recognized exploration geologist in gold, diamonds, copper, iron, and coal. Prior to joining DMCC, Martin worked with BHP Billiton Diamonds, marketing and grip diamonds and has extensive experience in marketing sales and business development across his career martin has lived and worked in 10 countries spanning africa europe australia north and south america and the middle east martin is a board member of the world diamond council a member of the executive committee of the wfdb and a certified six sigma black belt he holds a bsc honors in geology and a phd in exploration geology from the University of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom. A warm welcome, Dr. Martin Leek. It is Van Der Wecken, Executive Director for Responsible Jewelry Council, is with us today. It is has a background in law and international relations, a sustainability pioneer, leadership executive, humanitarian, and coalition builder with more than 20 years of global experience, working in fast-paced environments, including technology, diamonds, jewelry, fashion, and across government sectors. She initiated and chaired the United Nations Global Compact Network in Belgium and launched a children's rights and the role of business platform. She is committed to the agenda of gender equality. She was appointed as RJC Executive Director in March 2019 and is dedicated to a member's first strategy and contributing towards the 2030 agenda and the 17 sustainability development goals. She is a member of the board of ISEAL and the Dwellers Vigilance Committee. Iris has been an active volunteer for the Special Olympics for over 30 years. She ran the New York Marathon for UNICEF. A warm welcome to Iris, who will today guide us on the transparency and compliance for the diamond industry. Shabaj Mehta is the director with Rosie Blue Envy and a board member of GetDiamonds.com. Raj Mehta started his career in 1991 when he joined his father at Diamond Cutters Antwerp, where he set up and developed diamond polishing factories in Belgium and China. In 2001, Raj and his sales and manufacturing team joined Rosie Blue. With his experience spanning rough diamond sourcing, polished diamond manufacturing and sales, he is currently responsible for Rosie Blue Envy's polished diamond division, where he heads business development initiatives and optimizing distribution through continuous improvement in operational efficiency and implementation of new enterprise software solutions. He is also on the board of the recently launched GetDiamonds.com, fitted as the answer for a healthy and robust diamond pricing platform. We will get to know about it in this webinar. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome Mr. Raj Mehta to share his invaluable experience with us. Welcome, sir. Deepak Lucky, Managing Director, Sparkless International DMCC, is the third generation diamond here from Lucky Group, a 100-year-old company in the diamond industry. He is in the trade for over four decades and has overseen the cutting and polishing operations of the group, comprising of more than 20,000 team members. In this period, Lucky Group went on to become the largest producer of polished diamonds and became the highest individual taxpayer. Ethics and transparency is predominant within the Lucky Group. A keen observer of the diamond supply chain, Deepak Lucky has been successful in building enterprises. His strength is derived from understanding of the market and knowledge on sectors ranging from mining, production, finance. A mover among the miners, financers, and customers. Equally, Deepak Lucky has built a repute 
that is understandably one of the best in the sector. A warm welcome to Mr. Deepak Lakhi and hope your experiences would guide the industry to a logical conclusion. Our next speaker, Ms. Helen Molesworth, who is an industry advisor, has had a varied and international career within the gem and jewelry industry over the last 20 years. She started her career with the auction houses Sotheby's and Christie's, working as a jewelry expert in both London and Geneva, where she was a specialist on their magnificent jewels in Geneva, and was also in charge of selling private collection of Princess Margaret in London in 2006. Most recently, she was professor of history of jewelry in Geneva and created and launched comprehensive color gemstone classes across Switzerland, Hong Kong, successfully taking the business into China. The last 10 years, she has traveled extensively for all major international shows for business development, colored gemstone sources through Asia to America, and has taken on senior advisory and sourcing roles. Helen has a degree in classics from Christ Church, Oxford University, is a fellow of the Gemological Associations of Great Britain and Hong Kong, and a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in London. A warm welcome is Helen Molesworth to you. Thank you very much, participants. Speakers. It's my indeed my pleasure to welcome Ms. Nirupa Bhatt, who needs really no introduction, has been an ardent supporter of the industry. She's been there when the industry needed her. A warm welcome to her to moderate this webinar and see to it that the speakers, with their experiences, share the entire industry knowledge towards a perspective. Thank you very much, Ms. Bhatt, and welcome. Thank you, Subhu, and thank you all the panelists for joining us. Uh, Ashish, thank you for taking this initiative and continuing to work uh, to bring in uh, new topics and the panelists. The topic of today's webinar is Diamond Industry, Beginning of New Era. So we are saying it's beginning of a new era. So that sounds very optimistic, and I love that topic. Because I think we can always look at a glass and say whether it is half full or half empty. The situation that we are all currently in, it's not of our making. It happened and we, there is always a debate out there. Is it of our making, nature, etc. Et so let's leave all that aside. The question is, we are where we are today. And how do we look forward? How do we move forward? One can always look at this and say, is this the trigger that we needed to really make a change in how we work as an industry, become more efficient, be more respectful uh, of the uh, sustainability, the provenance claim, the supply chain, and so many things, the new way of doing business, et cetera, et cetera. And the industry, I'm sure, remembers uh, several challenges that it has had, and the most recent one was uh, the, in 2008 when we had the financial crisis. And uh, we did have problems at that time and the industry was concerned and worried and wondering what will happen next. And I think the industry emerged stronger after that. There was a period in between for a year or so where you know everyone was trying to understand what to do next, etc., etc. So Martin, I have a question for you. You were in BHP Bulletin in 2008, and you experienced that, and I'm sure you must have been sweating in those days, the way that our prices were behaving, and the uncertainty in the marketplace. You managed all of those. How do you look at today's situation compared to what we experienced in 2008, and what, does, what do you see as far as going forward is concerned? Yeah, thanks, Narupa. Um, look, the, the market situation in 2008 and today has a lot of similarities, but there's also some differences. So if you'll indulge me just a bit, let me just go back uh, and look at the, the state of the industry back in 2008. We had a much more consolidated supply. In that you have five major miners supplying regular customers. Today, we've got many more suppliers and most of the product, a lot of production is coming from tenders and uh, into the open market. So you're seeing a lot more volatility in today's market than you did back in 2000, pre-2008. The other thing is that in 2008, we had, De Beers had offloaded a lot of stockpile. De Beers was still owned by the Oppenheimer family and based in London, and there were good margins to have. So we went into 2008 crisis 
in quite healthy financial situations. There were several banks involved. Compliance was relatively easy. You just needed your passport for your KYC. Um, and, and, it, and it looked, in hindsight, when you look at today's situation, it was a lot more simple. But actually, we were also very complacent in 2008, and none of us saw the global financial crisis coming. And there wasn't a lot of innovation going on. So the 2008 crisis actually helped us innovate, helped us become more nimble, and helped us to adapt. And as we come into this crisis, again, nobody saw this crisis coming. It was a, it's a health crisis, which is turning into an economic crisis. Um, but the situation is, is also very different in that we can't travel. Um, trade is very much restricted. Um, supply is being blocked, which is a good thing. India is also imposing a ban on, on imports of rough diamonds. So you're starting to see people sell from inventory and getting goods back into the market. And as soon as we get those cogs of the trade going again, where people can sell cheap but buy cheaper, just to get the liquidity going and getting the industry moving again, I think we'll be in a lot better state. Looking forward, I, I think that uh, looking forward, we're going to have to look very much at technology at how, how the new world is going to operate. And when I say technology, I'm not just talking about Zoom meetings and um, high resolution photographs of your inventory on, the, uh, on different platforms. I'm talking about looking at your supply chain, how can automation, 3D, uh, 3D printing, robotics improve the supply chain so that we can speed it up. So we don't have this six to 12 month lag between mining a diamond and getting it onto the, uh, the retail shops. How can we get the diamonds to the market much faster? So that's, that's the areas that I'm looking for as we move forward. How can we use this crisis to really innovate and become much more nimble as an industry? Thanks, Martin. So Raj, very interesting perspective from Martin's point of view in terms of how he's experienced 2008 versus what he sees experiencing today and the future that he sees. He mentioned something very interesting, which is in 2008, the financial situation was healthy. And of course, there are some significant differences between then and now, which is in terms of the inventory and of course, the market had, the world had not stopped at that time. It had slowed down, there were issues, but now everything seems to have just stopped. And I think we are talking about the supply chain and uh, the inventory pileup, and he mentioned about 12 months, etc. The question, Raj, then is that the, many of the mining companies uh, or the miners have kind of either stopped or curtailed their production very significantly. We have read that in the press, uh, whether it is De Beers, whether it is Al Rosa, they have curtailed that production. The question is, how do you think, because you are in that mid segment, which takes rough polishes, the board manages the polish inventory and services, either jewelry manufacturers or the retailers. How has this crisis impacted that part of the supply chain? And how do we really move forward? Is there a, in terms of the beginning of a new era, do you see that we will, the, this part of supply chain will have to work differently? If yes, what are those changes do you think will help the industry, that segment? So uh, thank you, Nirupa. So what we see is uh, basically the inventory pileup has uh, happened over the last many years. Uh, it's not uh, uh, suddenly it has not come to light that there is an inventory pileup in the industry. There has been uh, a situation and the, the, the feeling that diamond people have is of a FOMO situation, fear of missing out. This fear of missing out on business is leading to a lot of uh, irresponsible uh, um, approach to business, over purchasing of rough, over manufacturing of polished, and um, without understanding a lot of the distribution side um, on the polished side as well. So we, we see that uh, all these uh, different um, angles that come into picture while you make a strategy into, for a business, has uh, made a, made a, made a, the situation today even much harder 
um, if you look at it. And um, of course, already at the end of 2019, we could see the business slowing down a little bit. Although it was slowing down January, February of this year, we saw a tremendous hype in rough uh, purchases, which was uh, very, very surprising. There was really no really reason to it. Um, then, of course, we had the COVID uh, situation that came into picture, which put a break to the, to, the, the, to the hype. But in really speaking, there was no need of that hype uh, in January, February. So this behavior and this approach to the, to the, to the industry, from the industry side has to be, uh, rather than looking at our competitors, what they are doing and what I'm missing out on, we should look in, inside our own companies and then strategize what we can do best and what we are best at, rather than uh, feeling that I'm missing out uh, because this company is doing this or my competitor is going in this direction. Um, if you really take uh, an inside look at your own companies, you will, you will understand better how to improve your uh, supply chain, how to, how to do the, 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 the purchases of rough, how you should be uh, in line with demand and supply rather than because I want to take market share or, or I want to uh, become number one. Um, all these decisions need to be way more sustainable and much more responsibly take, um, taken more responsibly. So this is how I, we see it. I mean, that's one way of, of, of limiting, uh, I mean, having a damage control, let's say, or even controlling uh, or best use of finance. If, you if I can just add one, uh, another kind of a very small question to that. What you say makes absolute sense. Do you think that we will remember as an industry once we start actually getting into routine and we will not be worried about missing out as it has always happened in the past. What's your sense or do you think this is much bigger and this will really impact how the industry behaves? What's your assessment? So looking at history, people forget very quickly what has happened in the past, um, unfortunately. Um, so far, we've only seen that we forget what has happened in the past. Hopefully, this situation um, will remind us that nothing is forever and uh, that we need to be very flexible and very, very, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, flexible in changing with times. And uh, like I said, the approach to the, to the business has to be looking inside your own business and what you can do with the finance that you have available, with the demand and supply uh, data that you have available, with your, uh, like uh, Martin also said, that the technological part on the, the supply chain, how do you shorten that? So people, I mean, I hopefully take another approach to the business rather than feeling constantly FOMO. Um, just as an example, I mean, FOMO is at every level of our industry, whether somebody participates at a fair, somebody does a deal in the rough or somebody does a deal in polished everybody feels that they are missing out because the competitor has done it but can you do it at a better level do you can you do it by adding value or are you just going to reduce your price by five percent and get the deal is that really the way you want to take it forward i don't uh, i don't think that uh, really adds any value to our industry and frankly speaking, we do not respect then the product that we are uh, in. Thanks, Rad. So again, it all comes to, and you mentioned this a couple of times, and I think Martin mentioned about money, financing, the availability of the credit line. So Deepak Bhai, given that this industry relies heavily, most industries rely, but we certainly we know that the diamond industry uh, relies heavily on the availability of the bank finance. And we had um, a lot more, I think, players, banks available uh, to us in the industry in 2008 compared to what we have today. What's your view on how the banks look at the industry today? And, in, and what's your assessment of how they see the future of the industry? How will they behave? Uh, what will be their attitude towards financing uh, the diamond jewelry industry? Thank you, Niripaji. This is a very critical question. And 
before i move forward thank you subhu for the nice words but uh, i wouldn't uh, accept it from myself but for my father my elder brothers who have been mentor to me all this and the great team behind me for the things that we achieved so anyways thank you for that and nirupa ji uh, you've been in the industry for so long and you know it also so well uh, talking about finance we have been having the finance which is ever increasing for the industry and we keep on having more and more finance but when we talk about diamond industry we need to understand what we are talking about actually the diamond industry as such we will crossly divide it into three parts which is one is the rough miners the primary source of rough suppliers second is the uh, manufacturers who are cutting and polishing the diamonds and thirdly the jewelers or the third part of the pipeline who is scattering it to the consumers and here we need to understand that who is needing the finance only the mid segment mostly the mid segment is requiring the finance and that's what we are talking about when we say diamond industry we are conveniently leaving those two ends which is quite unfair to the people who are in the middle and getting squeezed all the time so when we say Uh, about financing how do we see it but then uh, lately we have seen that the finance have been collateralized and banks are giving against the collateral and the collateral has to be as we know the capital goods and everything and the values have been going down so i don't see that uh, that has a scope of increasing the finance on that side and if they do i don't know how they will do it and secondly i think you did ask about the cluster funding is it is that no it? not yet but not yet go ahead no yeah so while funding the finance from the bank or saying for the cluster funding or etc so i want to cover that both in in a point that first of all that the manufacturers need the finance and why why do they need it because they are paying advance to the rough suppliers and then they are selling to the customers on the long credits so they are not financing their business but they are financing for the rough diamond that's perfectly all right they should be buying on the cash that's no problem but why should they be selling on credit instead of looking for more and more finance why shouldn't we create finance from our own inventory that is instead of calling it cluster fine funding i would say customer funding while we fund it for our rough purchases we fund for the uh, labor charges and the cost of production why shouldn't the customer fund for their own purchases yeah so i would also like to you know have the other panelists and cover this up later on saying what's their views and i would also ask the audiences who might be from all these supply chains whether they accept it they understand it that it is quite unfair to the manufacturers and if you go to see you know the cycles which we have come into like the manufacturers have to keep about one and a half to two months of rough inventories in their stock before they put it into the factories and the factories will again take two months to cut and polish it right and then we get it back and it's gia certified or sorted to be put on the table for sale then once it is sold uh it is sold on long credits 5 months 6 months whatever shorter to the longer credit but that could be the average and we can contradict that if somebody does no problem but maybe in the audiences so we need to find out that like, is that a right way of doing business and should the mid segment be squeezed from the both sides so i would say we should stop looking for the fresh finances instead we should create finance from within us from the inventory we also discussed that you know the inventories are huge say you know generally it is said that safely market is having 6 months inventory shouldn't we liquidate it in time liquidating not in by short selling it but creating a market for it and with appropriate marketing we sell it and on a very short credit or maybe it should be on cash also why not and then soon we'll see that we'll all be in a very comfortable situation 
and you know our group you know we are living that uh, experience and if somebody says it's not possible that we say it's very much possible if we want to and as martin also rightly said that you know uh, about the import ban the self ban by the industry it's a really good move that they are being sensible the industry is being sensible and they have to hold on to the buy and they have to cut short the credits let it be the you know cash sales or something and then we will be definitely out of the problem we'll so i think it subs in some ways it resonates to what raj mentioned earlier about this the supply chain or that mid segment is buying and getting all the finance or asking for the finance and giving credit to the uh, their customers be jewelry manufacturer polish and that is is it because there is a fear of missing out so maybe yeah. that's something where all the participants and i think all of us need to give it a thought that are we really afraid of missing out that we are getting into this kind of or we got into this kind of a situation so if i can switch uh, to the consumers uh, for a minute then iris you know we uh, have been discussing the issues that the supply chain uh, have uh, how do we really make sure that we make that uh efficient the fear of missing out there is a huge inventory etc and generally speaking the uh, jewelry manufacturers and the retailers who are uh, a very very important part of the supply chain what can they do to really or how can they help us to create more demand to create that pull because i know in rjc has been really working hard for many years now to create that transparency in the supply chain do you think this covid 19 will really is the turning point again so that what deepak bhai mentioned as well as to that if we have if someone really wants this why are we really why do we have to give credit because we have more supply than demand in very simple terms if i may say so so what can retailers do really to bring in their consumers and and bring that transparency what do the consumers want so from rjc perspective uh, can you tell us how what are the consumers expecting and how can rjc really help their participants and members nirupa first of all thank you very much for the opportunity for rjc to participate um if we look at the 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 post covid and the recovery stage we're hopefully starting to be in we know that before the covid came in that consumers especially millennials and gen z were already looking for much more uh, behind the product they want to understand what the product is all about what the company is doing and really understanding the values and the purpose of an organization and that's why you know responsible business is always you know the right way i mean that's you know should be a moral a human obligation but if we look at responsible business is good business we see that more and more the consumers are asking that question and at the end of the day it's all about trust it's about consumer confidence if we don't have a consumer that wants our product you know then we don't have a, a market then we don't even exist so what we see as rjc is first of all of course when we were founded in 2005 and think about it this is 15 years ago this was a very pioneer vision i mean it started when in 2000 with the kimberley process the establishment of the world uh, diamond council so the industry was really pushing forward and you had the mining houses like the beers rio tinto <laughs> driving proprietary initiatives then 2005 rgc and where are we now well indeed like you said we've grown we have today 1250 uh companies we include uh scope like color gemstones and silver but we believe there's a huge opportunity for more companies to step in and it's the only way forward and research and i invite you to look at some of the research that has been done during the uh covid period by bain are also looking at the consumers from uh from uh, uh industries and looking at luxury products looking at jewelry and what do they see is that the new cons- that the consumer that will get out of this covid will ask more critical questions about the authenticity about the management practices of the organization and how a company tackled covid in other words what are the concrete actions so i think that's the positive news 
Um, I think one element in Europa that I do want to add is that, uh, of course, it is complex. You know, sustainability is not an easy journey. It's a, it's a journey of continuous improvement. And I think it's important that we do not overpromise to the consumer, but that we tell, you know, the, the concrete actions. And that I think is why we as RGC believe we're more relevant and, than ever to really help companies be resilient and be ready for that consumer because we have this strong code of practices that includes human rights, labor rights, environmental impact, et cetera. So really to show that product integrity and management practices are at the heart of doing business. So it's the only way forward um, to drive consumer confidence and commercial markets. Thank you, Iris. So this, when you talk about, you know, we should, what the consumers would ask and they want to know how the companies behave during this period and all. All that leads uh, to that, how would we, how will the jewelers communicate and engage with the consumers? Now, so they have to engage with the consumers for the product and the practices, the business practices that they have been following. So in that sense, there is some sort of a, a communication, education, et cetera, that one would uh, need. So Helen, the question then is that we as an industry are very transaction based. We buy and sell. We don't really think of beyond that. I bought something, I sold something, this is the money I made and the story is done. The question is, do we, how do we really bring in this factor where we are able to really engage with the consumers? Because if, to say what Iris just mentioned, what Deepak Bhai mentioned about, you know, financing and why can't we give, why should we sell on credit? So how do we really help them? How do we help the retailers to really sell? And they don't have to give credits because if we see the retailers as well, they are giving long credits to their consumers as well. So what can we do to really help the industry to, how can we arm them? How can we help them to get this knowledge and education so they can engage? Is there a room you think? What would you recommend and how do we go about that? I think this is so true what a lot of people are saying here. We're seeing changes where we've got to adapt to what the consumers now need more than ever. And one of the most important ways of doing that is going to be getting across the level of trust. It's exactly what Iris just said. Um, and trust is basically about information and transparency, right? So people are going to need to have more information from us as the diamond industry, and they're going to have to have more transparency from the production line, and they're going to need to have more stories to be able to help sell the dream to a certain extent. But it's also been a change in the consumers where the younger generation now don't necessarily want the old dream that we sold them in the 1950s. And there is a change in the way that the young consumers are needing to have information. They don't just want to be sold to marketing. They want to understand really what's going on in our industry. And this is the transparency question. Um, they want more education than ever because they really want to understand the products, where they're coming from. Um, we see this not just in the young generation, but internationally in different cultures. It's up on the education hugely, understanding our industry. And I think it's our responsibility as part of the industry to make sure we supply that information in a completely open and available way because of course the trust that they then give us in the product that we are offering effectively. Um, and there's two ways this works. You know, it's not just the information that the consumers get, but it's also that we are educated. And I feel it's very important that the industry itself stays abreast of all developments, but also the information and how we can help then give that information to the consumers. It's a two-way situation. The more help we help learning ourselves, the more we're going to then create the trust and be able to sell better. So it's, it's you know, we improve the industry along the way. And for me, we're seeing at the moment wonderful moves um, across the board from people like De Beers to have had free um, access to online learning during COVID. This is industry responsible education because we are helping to support each other, which then long term will build the industry. Um, there are lots of other opportunities for education and learning. I think the newest one that I'm seeing is that the consumers really want to see what's going on at the source. This was not something we used to give them a few years ago. It was more to do with selling the dream. And more and more, 
the consumers want to know what's actually happening, where are the stones coming from, and what does that mean to me when the stone is mine? Again, something I've been showing people at the source, we've been taking students to, to visit these places. Um, and I think if people are more interested in education, fast track, tailored classes, give me a shout after the seminar and I'm happy to discuss individual options on email. But I think the most important thing from us as an industry is to have a holistic approach to being more open and giving as much information as possible to the consumer. Um, that's going to create the trust and transparency we need to build the industry further in these times. Thanks, Helen. So Martin, we talked about and you uh, mentioned and in the Dubai Diamond Conference, uh, which was the theme was disruption. And you know, how can a miner dig the diamond and really put that diamond straight into a jewelry. I'm putting it very simplistically in a ring and sell it. So what happens to the supply chain and the future of the trading, uh, the supply chain and also the future of, of the traders? Will the financing then shift? Deepak Bhai, let's smile. Maybe it will move to the mining companies. Who knows? Where do you see this going? And also, as, as a, a very, very important trading center, Dubai, what do you think and what are your plans to really make sure that whether it is transparency, whether it is disruption, automation, how will, what do you think is the future for Dubai and how will you make it easier for the businesses to come there and really grow? That is the question. That's a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> I am a very greedy woman. I, find <laughs> I don't lose any <laughs> No, they're good questions, Narupa. So, look, we're, we're going for a black swan event. There's no doubt about it. Um, we're, we're making it up as we all go along. Um, we don't know how this is going to end. We don't know when it's going to end. Um, but one thing that I'm absolutely sure about is that what happens at the end of this is going to be different to what it was before. So we need to look back at the basics about what we do. Deepak talked very nicely about the, the supply chain and the duration and the amount of inventory that we've got in the supply chain. And when you've got such a complex supply chain as what we have going from mine through the trading centers, to the manufacturing centers, to be put into jewelry, et cetera, to then go into retail and then to be sold eventually to somebody uh, for rights of passage, et cetera. You've got a lot, of, um, a lot of stakeholders along there. It's a very convoluted supply chain. And finance is always going to be critical for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, technology is going to be critical for that because at the moment, the status quo is that we've got a supply chain which goes from mine through to retail, which lasts between six to eight months, sometimes up to 12 months. And that's got to be shortened because those long inventories cost a lot of money to support. There's a lot of uncertainty in it. When you're buying rough diamonds, you're paying cash, you're paying prepayment basis, before you get your hands on them. And in a volatile world where you've got a volatile supply chain, uh, sorry, you've got a volatile market, when you're buying that rough diamond, you're buying a future in polished. And if you don't know what that future value is going to be, you're taking a gamble, you're taking a risk. And then to go back to what Raj was saying, you have the fear of missing out. Yeah. But uh, what are you actually missing out on? You're taking a big risk, and I don't think we completely understand what those risks are. That's why we focused at the Diamond Conference really on technology and how innovation can change things. Narupa, you used to work for the GIA, where it would take a long time to get a, a certificate for a diamond. So why can't you do that automatically through a machine? Why can't we get grading done through a machine, for example? And then we'll buy the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Transaction mindset. <laughs> okay, go or, on. Or maybe the machine goes to the retail to, as uh, yeah. Iris said and Helen was saying, around more transparency. The customer wants more yeah. transparency. Why yeah. does it even need to be anywhere near the factory? Why can't it be multiple locations? Um, I think we need to be really thinking outside the box. Box. And when I say the supply chain, 
needs to go from mind to finger in one day, just imagine what would that actually look like? How would we do that? Maybe one day isn't possible, but maybe one week, one month. How do we get into that mindset? And I think that's what we should be using our time for. How can we use technology to really make advances in the supply chain to improve the efficiency and to make sure that there are we have a robust industry as we move forward? Thank you. You raised a great question, and I have been thinking about this since I attended the conference of the disruption. But that also brings in a very other, very important question. And I have been having this question in my mind since I attended that conference. Never had the opportunity to ask, but I will pick Deepak Bhai's brain on this. You know, the pipeline has in some way shrinking, it consolidated in last few years. So as the number of players reduced, the capital they bring in the industry has reduced. So the availability, the risks have increased than what they were in the past. We mm -hmm. had more number of players, the risks were spread, et cetera, et cetera. So Deepak Bhai, in your opinion, this mind to finger concept, what will it do to the finance and what's your take on that? Well, uh, then the cycle becomes uh, quite uh, you know, small and if the miners can manage it and then they can put it to the jellers and they are selling it and then they wait for the customers to come and buy it and they are selling it for cash. That's a time frame they will require, but the management is huge. And it's like, you know, the farmers growing the food grains and then putting it to the restaurant and they are having their own restaurants. Great analogy. Yeah. So we are hypothetically discussing that. I appreciate it. And if that happens, I say, okay, bye bye. I look for some other uh, product and some other project, but then, this is a very time consuming thing. When we, when Martin rightly said that time takes to get the diamond certified, you know, we need to have the inventory for the factory. When it has to be cut and polished, we can, with all sorts of automation, there is still, you know, there's a saying that all the manufacturers of machines tell us that we are supplying you a very good machine, but this is not going to be the boss. You are the boss and you will have to take the decisions. So the human factor is not going out yet. So we cannot just churn out polished diamonds from the rough diamonds that we are getting the polished diamonds. And now only thing we've got to do is to set it in the ring and sell it. So there will be a lot of things. In fact, Martin, thank you for this. I was thinking about this because last conference was about all about automation. So that thing also came into my mind. Then why do the miners need to sell it to us? But then there's a catch also. The miners need to sell their uh, produce as soon as they have it, they need to sell it and they have to cash flow for their mind to keep on running. Somehow they are also going, you know, not so smooth with that. Maybe they are lacking the business skills. I don't know, there is a huge profit there, but it's still, they need their sales. Otherwise they are coming in the pressure. So talk about it. If that is going to take a few months of selling. Okay, they churn out the polished diamonds, they make the rings, they put it in the store. But supposing it takes three months, four months inventory to be there. So then they are getting the money in say five months or six months because the credit card money also comes to you in your account in a month or two. So it might be six months still. So are they going to able to manage? Do they have that skills? I thought of it. I was afraid. But then I said, no, it's not possible. And that gave me a comfort. <laughs> very frankly. Still. So in the meanwhile, so till we get to that very uh, kind of situation, which may be, as, in, as Martin said, a few weeks, few months, who knows? Because I think in today's age and time, I think it's, I would never say that will never happen. You never know how things change and how quickly they change. So I think we have to always think of the options. So in the meanwhile, we need various tools and platforms to really make sure that we are able to move the, uh, are able to connect with the prospective buyers and move the diamonds, jewelry, etc. So Raj, your absolute new initiative, Get Diamonds. So can you tell us what is so unique about that? 
and also the the question I have is: Is it a listing inventory platform, or are you also thinking? You know, we talked about the sustainability and all of those things. Will there be something, or these diamonds are by the RJC participants? So, if that is what the consumers, if what Iris is saying that the research suggests, that's what they want. Would get diamonds kind of consider that or have they thought about it? Is there a room to really think on those lines as well? I mean, it's, it's a big ask because managing inventory is difficult anyway. How do you further, you know, divide that inventory? So, uh, I'd like to just answer to the, uh, the questions that you raised to uh, Martin and to uh, Deepak by also just one short one. And then I'll go to your question on Get Diamonds. On those two questions about, I think profitability is an issue in our industry and therefore reinvesting in your business has become an issue for many of the players, uh, good players in the industry. So if pro risk reward was properly uh, managed and properly done, I think there'll be a huge amount of uh, investment by key players of the industry or technology and for the better of the industry. Profitability has become a very big, big, big uh, problem in the industry. So I thought profitability is a thing that we should also talk about uh, at some point, but okay, we'll talk about it later. Coming back to uh, Get Diamonds and your questions on that. So Get Diamonds is uh, it's not my own personal initiative. It is an initiative yeah. uh, done by the by the diamond industry and for the diamond industry, as we say, it was informal group of, uh, of companies and people who got involved together and uh, started this movement, as we called it in the beginning. And uh, today we have on it just under $5.6 billion worth of uh, diamonds, um, around 3,000, under, just under 4,000 registered companies and around 27,000 uh, users on it. On a day-to-day -day base, we have around 88,000 views on Get Diamonds at the moment with around uh, 39,000 uh, page views. So the numbers are uh, unbelievable. The, the, um, the kind of um, potential that Get Diamonds has is unbelievable. And we can see from the sheer level of, of, of the people that moved on to Get Diamonds in a very short period of time is just uh, amazing. Um, that the, the, the industry needed something else. So this platform is basically made for the industry, by the industry, and why is it made? It is made to bring in more transparency, as we all sp spoke about it, to bring more trust into the diamond industry and how it's uh, structured on the, from the price angle also and how, um, uh, how the future of the industry will be from the pa platform point of view. So what is going on as, as we speak is, okay, we have a platform. There are many platforms, no doubt. Um, but this platform is basically under WFDB, which is the World Diamond Federation of Bourses. It is very important. And it is uh, managed by a, board, by a few board members that were selected over the last two weeks and um, at the moment. And um, what our game plan and what our plan of action is to make it the platform for the diamond industry. And that means throughout the whole supply chain. So we would uh, like the buyers and that is uh, the retailers also to join in and use Get Diamonds as their reference point. Um, it will be, uh, the Get Diamonds will supply. So what we are doing basically right now is we're in talks with external companies, which will build a proper, uh, what do you call, benchmark price uh, system with data and, uh, and not just by a single person's uh, decision. It will be a decision of algorithms. And uh, that is what we're going to be launching. But it is not Get Diamonds who's going to be launching. We are going to give the data and supply that data to third party companies who will then uh, give us the price structure of how diamonds are, the asking prices and how the selling prices are. So it is going to be based on realistic numbers 
with full transparency. So that gives, what does that do? That basically gives a lot more trust in the way diamonds are priced. Uh, it gives more transparency in the way diamonds are priced. It is, it is an easier way to even explain consumers and retailers that these diamonds are priced not by a single person or by a person's mood swings, but basically done by the actual transactions and the, uh, the data that is behind it. So, um, and, and that's why it's made. This is, um, and we need basically the most important part in getting this through and have it successfully, uh, have a successful approach to this is that it remains unified by the industry. We cannot have the industry split into different sectors, if different races or different countries or different anything. Everybody who has a, uh, a financial or a mean has uh, thinks about the future of the industry should be unified into it. We cannot have people parting and it is very, very difficult. It's a very difficult task. Um, we understand the situation of today that many companies and many uh, due to the, the, the basic, what do you call the basic environment that we are in right now, where the market and the business is slow that people need sales, we all need sales, we all need to uh, run our businesses and everything, but we have to keep patience. I mean, this, this, this platform has been only in existence since now over two months. And in two months, the group of people achieved uh, to, uh, to get five, $5.6 billion worth of diamonds on it with around uh, 25,000 users and just under 4,000 uh, subscribers, uh, registered suppliers. So it, it takes time. Of course, today's day and time, we have uh, the social media, which helps us. But uh, at the same time, we need people to understand that anything that we want to do well and do it properly, we have to do it with proper strategy. And we have to make sure that we are in a, in a, in a transparent way and approaching, I mean, this remains transparent and does not become a single man's uh, show business, basically. So, so the main aim of this platform is to create completely an independent nonprofit organization. I mean, it is already by a nonprofit organization, WFDB, but we want to remain so, and we want to keep it completely transparent. So, so we, we welcome everybody to put their stones on it, to put their list of stones on it, to use Get Diamonds as a reference point. We understand that there are many platforms and, and other platforms today still have a better, let's say, uh, a better sales, probably a sales, uh, they are better sales tools so far. But if we have everybody united on this one, we can get to where we need to. It will take time, uh, nothing happens overnight, um, but we hope that this, this uh, everybody remains united here. Thanks, Raj. Iris, uh, you know, in all our discussions, things seem to be really, at the end, going to retailers. I think Deepak Bhai mentioned the play role retailers play. Raj just mentioned that the new platform also, we are hoping that more and more retailers will come on the platform and use that platform. And you also mentioned that the research has shown that the consumers really want that transparency, etc. So how, what is RJC planning to really bring in more uh, participants on its platform and particularly more retailers? I think that's very important. The RJC believes in a, a partnership uh, model, uh, Nirupa. Uh, we also believe that the only way forward to uh, retain our membership, but also to attract new members is to work together in collaboration with many organizations. And when I just hear, uh, you know, Raj, about this platform, you know, my first call of action to the World Federation of Diamond Horses is, you know, how can we work together with RJC? How can we ask members of that platform, for example, you know, to give them the option to join the RJC and take the time to integrate the code of, the code of practices into their operations? Um, so I think another element is that we want to work with all the centers around the world. We have Martin here, from Dubai, we have uh, Anthro World Diamond Center, we have uh, the course in Mumbai, we have, we have GGPC, we have so many organizations across the world 
that we want to work together. And, and because we also believe that's the only way forward, like we said, for the industry to be united and to be able to show that trust. And I think the heart of the matter in Europa is if we ask about the future of responsibility, and that's, you know, if, if you look at what other industries are doing, it's all going to be about showing environmental, social and governance data. And that finally will come to the consumer. If the consumer wants to understand behind that product and behind that story is a company with purpose, a company with values, a company that integrates human rights, labor rights, has a climate action plan, well, that will show the real purpose for the consumer. But I also have to acknowledge, you know, that yes, there are small players and large players. So there is a necessity to, you know, work close together, to share the educational material. And as RJC, we also believe we have a huge opportunity now to um, give also a lot more educational material. And I think a final uh, note I want to share in, the, in this panel, uh, Nirupa, is that, as you know, in 2015, 193 countries negotiated and have a united front to say, this is what sustainability means, the 17 sustainable development goals. And many of those goals, you know, all the goals touch our industry, but many of the goals, if you think about gender, uh, think about eight uh, decent uh, labor, uh, economic growth, 12 uh, responsible production and climate, uh, uh, partnerships, uh, all these goals matter for our industry. I think it will be a huge opportunity. We have a decade now to show as an industry, we have always cared, but we, you know, we care and we care and the consumer cares. And I think, you know, we are, our, our product, you know, uh, uh, Raji was saying, uh, you know, nothing is forever, but diamonds are forever. Uh, so we have a huge opportunity to tell, to tell a story of positive impact. So the RGC is here to support organizations worldwide to work together very closely um, and to be inclusive for small and large enterprises to integrate sustainability into their operations. So this is a call for action. Thank you, Iris. So before I, I have one more question for Helen, but before I go there, we are receiving a lot of uh, questions from the participants and I would request all those who are um, here on our uh, meeting platform today, but please do continue to post the question. And then I think Subhu, you will take it and then ask the question, is that? Yes, yes of right? course, I will take the question. Yeah. Okay. So before we go, just last question, uh, Helen, can you look at your crystal ball and tell us what are the consumers, <laughs> what do the consumers want? What kind of jewelry are they looking for? Lightweight, gold, diamond, color stone, pearls, what is it? Has COVID changed anything, their perception, their preferences? I love this. I mean, I've always been asked throughout the last however many years, what's tomorrow you know what what are people going to want what are things going to be worth and one of the classic answers i don't have crystal ball right but i've also learned something very important and actually i think raj you touched on this I've, i say quite often if you want to see where you're going look at where you've been and you can learn so much through history and patterns that we've seen and quite often we forget what's happened one or two generations before us and I find this whole COVID instance extremely fascinating because everyone's saying we're in an unprecedented time. We've never been in this before. This is true. We've never had a global pandemic at the level at which it's affected the world this highly. But we've been through world wars. We've been through the Spanish flu. We've seen things change in the industry that are comparable with diamonds that we've had with color stones already, like synthetics. So this particular time in history, I think it's quite interesting to take lots of small different examples that have been previously massive influence factors, political, economic, technological developments, and to see that actually we are not in a single post-COVID situation here. And I think this is the danger we have in our um, particular situation right now. Yes, we're gonna have a change after COVID, but don't forget we were already in the middle of several huge shifts within the industry and globally already. We'd already seen the up and coming change with China, with the new generation, with digital, and also with uh, synthetics. And my prediction, if I may, is going to be that yes, we will see a downturn after COVID because there'll be a global economic knock, knock on. Of course, we're gonna see a global recession to some extent. 
But don't forget that we've had all of these other factors that are going to affect demand and supply already in place. And I would sort of see this a bit like what happened in World War II. There was already a pattern of things happening in the 1930s in jewellery design. People wanted white diamonds. After World War II, and things, they basically went back to almost nothing had happened to change in the jewellery design. So people just went, yep, that's done. I want to... Did we lose but, Helen? Oh, you're back. Yeah, it's okay. I was going to say, we're going to have a shift because people are going to spend more carefully. But I think five years. So my message at this point would be, please don't be afraid. I don't want people to be terrified of where we're going because we can deal with this and with change comes opportunity. But at the same time, to be aware of the influences pre-COVID, why don't we deal with the effect of synthetics within the market and how we need to redefine the natural market? Look for what the young generation is really looking for. And to realize that in every time of big shift financially and economically, jewelry and gemstones have always survived because we've got one aspect that not everybody has. We've got an emotional product that has got sustainability together with an investment value. And I think to a certain extent, if we are able to redefine what we stand for to the consumers and give them the confidence that there is a reason to continue buying into luxury goods, even when we've redefined that perhaps our families and our health are our number one priority, that's still buying into that for the reasons that we have that no other industry can supply. Finance, stability if we make it, investment value and the emotional side with the eternal concept of diamonds, then I think we have great hope for the future. So my message, I love what Raj said, the FOMO thing, we all get it. I love the comments on history, but we've got to take this forward, like Iris said, as a holistic approach to realizing we've been through changes and we'll make great opportunities out of the ones that we are by having these discussions. I love that optimism at this time. <laughs> we have <laughs> to, I right? We all it's all we have. <laughs> you are so right, Helen. Thank you. I think that was wonderful. So, Subo, over to you with the yes. questions you have. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question which has come in for Mr. Raj Mehta. Since there is an inventory problem with the suppliers, will there be a price war in the near future with respect to diamond <laughs> supply? Price war, Mr. Mehta? Price war, I mean, that's a very big topic. Everybody's, so you have to understand everybody's business model and business, the way it is, uh, is, is quite different. Why does a price war happen, basically? When you have oversupply and you have less demand, right? So it's all relative to demand and supply. So pe that's exactly what I was trying to say, that people need to understand that if there is a demand X, you need to supply Y. I mean, you cannot just start supplying X times two. And that is when price war happens. That's one of the things. Secondly, another price war happens also because the business is very scattered. Distribution of our business right from the rough down with the polished, everywhere the distribution is overly scattered. Everybody is trying to do everything. So, and that, and that causes a price war. So yes, there is a very low level of demand right now. People are getting overexcited with China opening up and buying and revenge buying and all that happened. But what people are forgetting is that other centers are yet closed. They have not opened up uh, fully and they, they don't have the same approach as the Chinese consumers have when they buy. So we have to remember that the supply has to remain very calm and very quiet. We should not be oversupplying. But at the same time, don't, there is the, the, the demand is so limited that every company is trying to take advantage of that little, little demand. So everybody is running after that little demand. And while you are running after that little demand and for the cash flow of many businesses and many companies, they have, they have a price for, and therefore this is what happens. On the other hand, if the supply, of course, COVID was never on the, on, on anybody's schedule. This is a shock to the world. So nobody was ready for it. But in general, if your supply remains very much in control with demand, Price war would be more uh, uh, a discussion of just competition, but not a war. And that is, the, that is the situation we are in. So yes, there could be a price war for a short period of time, 
according to according to what we see and because of the little demand that there is and the need of cash flow for many businesses absolutely thank you so much mr mehta uh, the next question we have got here is for dr martin leek uh, what is your message to the mining entities the miners and will dubai and uae be tendering diamonds even during this period of volatility uh, would you like to take that dr leek sure oh, um message to the miners is good luck um it's a tough time i've been there you know you've got to uh, you got to look very much at your 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 costs your operations um your supply um and what it's going to look like by taking uh, uh a reduction in price um with dubai we are open um i think we'll be back at 100% next week um the issue with the tenders at the moment is that uh, whilst we're open and the, the the tender floor is open um is the, the lack of travel is the difficulty in international travel especially from india i spoke earlier about the indian um voluntary um ban on on importing rough uh which i think is a good thing as deepak said uh, i think it's a good thing in that it will allow people to sell them from inventory but it can't go on forever and we will need to get back to business we will as i said i, I agree with helen you know we've been through pandemics before we will get over this life will return to normal we're not going to go back and live in caves we're going to be able to shake hands again and get on with business and get on aeroplanes but it's going to take some time and we need to do it properly and safely so those are my messages all right thank you doctor we have a question here which is uh, for the floor any of the speaker who wishes to answer can do it can you please help the industry in recommending alternative finance options do you have a process with respect to finance requirement alternative finance options any of the panelists can take a, take this question well i'd love to say um if i may that i'm working with some vehicles within the industry that are alternative finance options so i'm happy to raise my hand and say if anybody would like to send me an email after this i'd be delighted to discuss opportunities with them as needed um you know we've all said we need to help each other as much as possible alternative options and just discussions at this point to see how people can be helped the liquidity is going to be so important in the supply chain it already has become so we know this more than anything from experience in previous years and and right now i'd be very happy to discuss this with anybody who needs um a bit of a bit of advice or perhaps some direct help so please email me afterwards i hope you don't mind me jumping in there sibu thank you ma'am can i uh, continue with this question uh, with your permission okay. yeah yeah please iris wanted to say something right. so iris please yes, go ahead uh, yes mr iris you can and then I'll... when we talk about access to finance and uh, bankability uh, it's a uh, it's a term that eric jens always uh, has used but you know it's again uh, what is really critical is the element again of trust and transparency and practices of an organization and just for your information and i think helen we should definitely take that conversation offline is uh, is that we as rgc are also starting uh, discussions with financial institutions and also uh, private equity companies just about the linkage also of the implementation of uh, the work like on the code of practices and what that means to the element of trust so if we want a resilient business you know it needs to be a trusted business and for that again you need data so i go back to the heart of the matter in esg environmental social governance data it is the future for the industry and we as rgc are here to partner with all the organizations to drive that thank you so much uh, uh, the last point we are taking a cue from the earlier question alternative finance will attract huge interest rates so will it be really viable for the industry to get into alternative financing uh, mr mehta or mr lucky can take this point no i mean the interest rates are already quite high um but there is a reason for it of course uh, so again like iris explained transparency uh, is very key to keep the interest rates under control because if transparency is high um the confidence of the people who will finance this industry or the banks or other other institutions will remain very high and the comfort level will remain very high so of course that is pretty much linked with transparency um industry cannot take 
high interest rates anyway i mean higher than today it's already it's, uh, it's peaked so i don't believe so there is no there is no profitability in the business so to pay higher interest rate is definitely not the case thank you so much uh, over to you ms but so thank you all for uh, being on our panel and answering questions and i think from what we have discussed has a couple of things subu yeah. uh, and uh, ashish uh, for future that needs discussion i would certainly like i think the dmcc conference which was about disruption i think needs further conversation and discussion i yeah. think we need to really talk about that more and how will it impact the industry uh, how do you use the various platforms uh, uh, which are available and i think there was who mentioned about being you know that we i think raj mentioned that we want to do everything because we don't want to miss out on anything so is being a niche player specialization is that the need for tomorrow will that help so i think all there are there lots of uh, i think uh, food for thought there's a lot of food for thought that has come off by the comments and the responses that we heard from the panelists and i would also think that uh, it would be great uh, is to hear more uh, from the rjc perspective you know because we've had rjc i think how can it really become the very important tool for the industry participants much more than what it is today and i think if sustainability is important if whatever you just mentioned working with the financial institutions so i think there are lots of things and the industry would really would like to hear from you what are you doing or your progress with the uh, financial institutions etc so thank you again uh, all the panelists for being there and of course anyone needs money miss helen has been not <laughs> 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 very quickly thank you everybody i would like to thank you so much thank you so much thank you tnj for inviting us thank you so much mr thank you very much and uh, i thank uh, i take this opportunity from the new jewel international media group to thank mr dr martin lee mr raj mehta mr iris van der wecken mr deepak lakhi mr helen molesworth for having shared their experiences and the next webinar is going to be exactly what mr nirbhavat said supply chain disruption where oh. we are planning, where we are planning to invite bankers suppliers as well as mining entities and today uh, we have Uh, representatives from al rosa also in the webinar they are participating thanks to them and uh, the next week the next webinar is going to be big fight uh, no i'm sorry it's going to be big talk <laughs> i welcome i welcome i welcome all the participants once say it with your heart subu <laughs> <laughs> i corrected myself it's not going to be a big fight it's a big talk and uh, thank okay. you but thank you mr ashish garg i invite mr ashish garg to give a word of thanks uh, thank you Thank you, Subhu. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants and all the speakers who you know, have discussed uh, this very important issue today. Uh, industry pain, the midstream pain, was very evident in the discussion. At the same time, a lot of uh, you know uh, innovative innovations and uh, the transparency issue has been highlighted. And I feel this discussion will definitely help a lot of people to uh, course out the new future. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, over to you, Subhu. Thank you once again to the presenters of this webinar. Uh, Anand, can you play the video once again uh, to our participants? Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Today, it is not the strongest that survives, but the most adaptable. The World Federation of Diamond Bourses is constantly adapting itself to an ever-changing reality. That's why we are proud to present Get Diamonds. Our new state-of-the-art online diamond center for the industry, by the industry. With Get Diamonds, you get transparency. You get a competitive free market that gets you more business. That's how, in five weeks, you get a platform with five billion dollars in total value. So don't get left behind. Get Diamonds. the biggest diamond search platform in the world A diamond is not just a purchase it represents our most precious moments and memories with a timeless beauty that never fades 
At De Beers Group Institute of Diamonds, we know how much consumers appreciate being informed enough to choose the diamond that best suits their needs and desires. But making this choice isn't easy without expert advice supported by reliable and precise grading. That's why we offer a premium grading service intended to build and maintain relationships based on trust that keep our clients returning again and again. De Beers Group Institute of Diamonds benefits from over 130 years of leadership and expertise with unparalleled access to cutting-edge research and technology, ensuring that all of our products are natural, untreated diamonds graded to the highest level of accuracy, integrity and consistency. So how do we maintain these exacting standards? First, we operate a strictly anonymous black box system, which allows us to treat each diamond we receive equally and without bias. Second, the technology we use is designed and engineered by us, ensuring uniformity across every single one of our laboratories. And finally, each diamond is carefully studied by no less than three highly qualified diamond experts who separately allocate each grade with an expert eye. Our grading reports are designed to help you understand what makes each diamond truly unique. We take pride in being a source of support for our customers and in guiding them from a position of trust through every step of their search for their perfect diamond. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for the panelists. We take your leave. Thank you. Thank you, Nirupa. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you everybody. so much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Bye, Helen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.